Well, good morning. Um, it's good to see you all. I know we are missing a lot of people this morning, but still pretty full, I'd say. Um, so, I guess if you're if you're guests, I think we have a few I'm seeing. So, welcome and thank you for joining us um, this morning. Um, I guess to introduce myself, and if you don't know me, um, I'm Johnson. I'm the youth pastor here at Hillside, and uh, and we're still. This morning, we're going to be continuing our series in John. Uh, as Pastor Clint has been working through that this past uh, few months, I think, so far. But anyway, we're going to be continuing our series in John uh, as he's away. Um, as, as you heard from Jeremy, that he's just has a new grandchild. So, um, so one thing about me, I think I mentioned uh, before, is I'm one of three siblings. And uh, I'm the youngest of them. But... This morning, do we have any other uh, favorite, I mean, youngest siblings out there? I don't know. Anyway. Ah. <laughs> but if, uh, just kind of just thinking, like, if you have siblings, though, like more, I'm going to say this when I was younger, like, did you guys ever get in conversations or kind of debates with them where there comes a point, though, that you end up realizing that they maybe they are right, um, but you don't really want to acknowledge that, so you kind of start using stuff against what you know about them, to kind of avoid them kind of getting to that winning the argument kind of thing. Um, I don't know if you have something you can relate to that. That was just, I just wanted to share that story because it, it kind of is the mentality of what we're going to be working through of this crowd of people that are in Jerusalem as they're kind of struggling to recognize Jesus as more than a man from Nazareth. They're kind of only letting themselves kind of acknowledge this one fact about him. They're not wanting to learn more about him, I guess. As we're going to kind of look uh, a little bit more into that um, this morning. But as we're jumping, I think, uh, no, Pastor Clint uh, finished off chapter 6 last week, and then we're kind of jumping a bit forward, though. We're going to do the second half of chapter 7. Um, and and the kind of, though, the themes are happening, because it's been a little bit, I think, since uh, Clint spoke on this, is basically the first part of the chapter. Uh, Jesus is talking with his brothers in Galilee, um, and kind of acknowledging where they're wanting him, trying to urge him to go to Jerusalem, um, to go to this festival of tabernacles, but he's at that time saying this is not the right time. Another thing that's kind of happening in this chapter, which I'm going to focus, tell a little bit more about, is Jesus is starting to speak, because later he does go about halfway through this festival, um, but he's starting to speak, and he's trying to, to get them to acknowledge him again, since it's been some time since he's been in Jerusalem. Um, He's speaking about, um, uh, there's this man that he's healed, to kind of to, to, for them to acknowledge that he is uh, the Messiah. Sorry, I'm losing my place. Okay, I'm going to just jump ahead a bit so we can get going. So, so briefly, those are a couple of events that happen before we jump in this text today. Um, we're going to see that there's a division amongst the people and leaders who are with uh, uh, about who Jesus is, as this is during more of the second half of the t- Feast of Tabernacles. So initially, um, as Jesus has been away from Jerusalem and Galilee before this, it's been some time since he's been over here. He's been in Galilee for a while, since chapter 5 is the last time he's mentioned being in Jerusalem. Um, which I'll first just read the opening couple of verses of this uh, passage, which is in John 7, we're going to start in uh, verse 25 and 26. Um, which it reads, at, th- at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they are trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly, and they are not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? Because uh, just before this, as Jesus is beginning to teach at this festival, there's a point where they, he says that they're trying to kill him, but a lot of the crowd are confused with what he's meaning. You're f- confused about what he's referencing, because maybe not all of them have been at Jerusalem at that time. So he's kind of going to make reference to, which I'll share a bit from this time he's healing this man in Jerusalem before. Because initially what it reads just before this in verses 19, 20, like Jesus is saying, has not, has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. And why are you trying to kill me? But they're, as they're responding, like, you are demon-possessed. The crowd answered, who is trying to kill you? As they are kind of saying, they're not... 
understand what he's coming from as he just started speaking at this festival and halfway through. So it's kind of seemingly random to them at that time. But, but Jesus then goes explaining and asking for the people to judge correctly uh, following this passage, where he spends some time talking about what is deemed acceptable on the Sabbath, which, as he's pointing towards um, this healing with this man, uh, how the Pharisees kind of acknowledge that um, is what he's going to be talking about as they would accept, say, circumcision was deemed good acceptable, but healing a man they did not see as acceptable, which he kind of talks about in this passage just before in chapter 5. Um, but yeah, so Jesus is reminding them initially here that the last time he was with them in Jerusalem where he heals a man that was crippled for 38, for 38 years um, and says so by this miracle, though, that kind of brings about a conversation between him and these religious leaders in Jerusalem which then leads to him sharing that he's the Son of God um, to them, which I'll read out. Uh, so because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute, persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. But not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was also even calling God his own father and making himself equal to God. Because in this claim before the leaders here, like Jesus is challenging them to not only, that he's not even just breaking the Sabbath law in their eyes, but uh, as the leaders do not acknowledge that he is the Messiah, he's also, in their eyes, claiming that blasph this blasphemous status, that he's equal to God. Um, and which in turn leads them to turn against him and desire to kill him. So then we, kind of, this is kind of what's happening. He's referencing this uh, initially, though, that they've been trying to kill him when he first starts speaking in the Festival of Tabernacles. Um, this is reminding the people of who he is and what he's done just before this, um, where, say, he's, he challenged, in that time, say, the practices were held regarding the Sabbath as he healed this man, which they deemed was not acceptable because it wasn't seemingly as urgent, but they did accept in that passage, like they accepted circumcision because um, it was with the law of Moses. Um, so they're following the law of Moses because if someone was born on the Sabbath, Seven days later, they would have to go through with that. Um, so they deemed that as acceptable. So they were, um, the priorities, I guess, were out of, out of line. And Jesus was calling them out on this to judge correctly. But Jesus is also praying them for where our passage this morning will focus, as the more I've just been kind of trying to go through some of the background. Um, but we're calling them to have, he's calling them to have discernment and look beyond a superficial perspective um, Say, to judge what is good, because if it is acceptable, say, as he's saying, to circumcise on the Sabbath, as Jesus is showing them, then healing a man is just as acceptable and good. But going now back to our initial verses, like, we see that the people listening to Jesus are really realizing that this man that has healed the paralyzed man, he has healed this paralyzed man, and, and now, though, these religious leaders that had been speaking to him and wanted to silence him this last time, Right now, they're, they have been silent. They're not really kind of attacking him. They're not really saying anything. They're just remaining silent. But as the passage continues, we see that um, they're struggling, though, to, ident to see Jesus as Messiah because they already know a little bit about who he is, and he's not who they're expecting to be that. As it continues, like, have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? Say, this, this man who they recognize, and even though, say, they have heard his teaching, have seen the miracles he performed, for instance, with this man, he's just brought that back to recall that, and there's other signs he's been performing. But do the re religious leaders really see him as being the Messiah? And as we look forward, we see how the reasoning does not, it does have grounds in Scripture, it does have, but it's coming from a limited perspective because they're choosing what they're knowing about him. They're not really choosing to seek to know him, they're just going off what they know, have heard about him. As in verse 27, kind of more continuing, like, but we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from, because the people know that Jesus is from Nazareth. That he's taken, say, and they've taken this fact to allow it to fully convince them that because of this, Jesus could not possibly be the Messiah. He's only this man, and they, they don't see him as the Son of God, not divine. But then Jesus, in response, is proclaiming this to them. Then Jesus said, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I'm not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. So, 
So we're seeing, like, so Jesus does come up from above. He didn't just exist at the time when he's born in Bethlehem. So also these people are forgetting or not realizing his, his lineage and what he came from, that he is the son of David. Well, he's from the line of David, and he was born in Bethlehem. So he, he's fulfilling those themes, but they're just seeing him in, from, from Nazareth. Um, um, but here we see that Jesus proclaimed that he is the Messiah. He's been sent down to earth by the Father. And we also see that Jesus is saying that those here in Jerusalem listening do not really know God. But even though, in their tradition though, this is something that they would have prided themselves in, but he's saying to them that they don't really know God because they're not recognizing him um, because they don't um, know him. Like as we you know from John 1.18, it says, no one has seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and in, is in close relationship with the Father and has made him known. The Son, say, has made him known in the life and example of Jesus before this crowd is the only way they can truly know the Father. Um, but as it continues, we see that the response, it shows unbelief still that Jesus in his claim. And as they tried to seize him, no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. We don't know how, say, Jesus avoids, say, directly them seizing him, but we know what we can take from that is that man cannot overcome the will of God as Jesus, say, hour had not yet come, as he, was, he spoke that earlier to his brothers before he went to um, the festival. But that would come, say, that's coming later during the pa- pa- time of Passover when he goes to the cross for our sins. As they say, this moment, his time had not yet come, as he speaks before this crowd. But I also see those, this, these people in Jerusalem, despite, let's say, they've seen the signs he's performing, they've heard his teaching that he's given, but they're choosing not to acknowledge him as their Messiah, as he's not met their expectation of who this is, uh, more in their earthly understanding. Which, I guess, trying to think of an application for this, I was, for our perspective, even though it's a little different, like maybe it's for us uh, wanting to meet someone, maybe like a, f- a famous celebrity that we really admire, or something like that, where they almost have, before meeting them, like I haven't really my personally met I met maybe one or two when I was younger, but they weren't really ones I was knowing very much of, I guess. But I guess th- those, those you look up to, those celebrities you look up to, though, you almost have this ideal of them. They're almost, they kind of seem superhuman. They kind of seem um, beyond reality in a way. But once you meet them, though, you realize they're just as ordinary as others around you. Um, and this is kind of like, with Jesus, of course, is a little bit different. Uh, context, but for those in Nazareth, like for those here, though they just see him as a guy from Nazareth, they don't really recognize him as divine, and maybe this is getting them caught up. So, because um, yeah, maybe they did see him as a good teacher or a prophet, but not their Messiah, and it, it wasn't in their mind that say that this man who is larger than life would come, that would come to free them from their oppression bondage. Um, from a, and from the Roman overlords, they didn't see Jesus as being this man. He didn't fit the description that they were hoping for. Um, and we see that, say, they've chosen to believe, not to believe in Jesus, and not to turn to him, at least with this crowd. But as we move forward, Jesus then kind of starts highlighting the fact that the time he has with them is very limited. Um, that... For instance, um, as we go forward in verse 31, it says, Like still many in the crowd believed in him. They said, The Messiah, when this Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? Um, so uh, there's expectation, at least with these, this group, though, that must, the Messiah would perform great signs as Jesus has been doing. Maybe this is more so with this group than these other ones who don't believe in him um, in Jerusalem. But... Their belief is based on what they've seen him do, based off the signs they've seen him perform, which on the surface seems genuine, but the question they pose in it, like referring to Messiah, like, will he perform more signs? We see that the core of their belief is based on what they see, not over his teaching and not over how he lives his life, an example he leads. Uh, and they say it's not fully known to us if this was genuine or if it's like those back, like John references one account in John 2, uh, about after Jesus clears the temple courts, um, where there's a time where, say, many people are seeing these signs he's performing and they believe in him. Um, 
like as it says, like now, while they were in Jerusalem at the Passover t festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. Where this group, that are back in chapter 2, they're interested um, because the miracles, not that he's requiring them to change how they're living, not because um, and not, they don't really fully understand also probably what he means when he, in that time, he's kind of t saying that he would rebuild the temple in three days, so they're not understanding his ministry. Because um, Jesus is saying that he would not entrust himself to them, so as he knows their hearts, he knows what their actual desires are. But this group in chapter 7, though, say there are, as they're publicly professing that, say, he is the Messiah, this begins to bring a reaction of the Pharisees who, say, had been silent up to this point, as Jesus had uh, approached and started to teach. Um, where the Pharisees heard of the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. So now I say the Pharisees are trying to arrest Jesus um, for this rising popularity among the people and the, their belief that he is the Messiah. So initially the crowd, those from Jerusalem, are the ones who tried to arrest Jesus, but now it's also the Pharisees who are now feeling threatened um, by this popularity and the different, this different teaching, this different teaching is challenging also their authority, and all, and now they're choosing to no longer be silent. Just similar to how they did when he had healed the paralyzed man, back in chapter five. But then, even as, despite this, even though these these guards are approaching to arrest him, God, uh, Jesus then addresses the crowd again, where he says, "I'm with you for only a short time, and then I'm going to the one who sent me." You look for me, but you will not find me, and when I, where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where, you, where I am, you cannot come? Like initially we can know, say, well, he is referring to the Passion Week um, in this, the time where I say he would die and he rise from the grave in the defeating of sin, and then ascend back to heaven. Um, but it's also made clear, though, um, the need for this in, ch uh, in chapter 16, verse 28, where Jesus, in this instance, is talking to the disciples. But he says, I came from the Father and entered the world, but now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Where he's once more, you say, he, he needs to return to heaven until the time of the second coming, and those responsible, though, those responding, though, are unable to understand what he's meaning. Uh, they're initially, I think you say, referring to somewhere else in the Rome, Roman Empire or where these other people are living as they do not recognize him um, fully as, say, divine. They do not realize he, that he's referring to the time where he has to ascend into heaven. Um, but yes, so... See, so we're seeing, though, that even though they've come to their belief, they say they believe that he's Messiah, they're not fully recognizing him as the Son of God, um, or they're at least not fully understanding what he's meaning um, as he says this, as that he's going to be with them, but only for a short time more. And like Jesus is preparing for where he's going to focus, talking about the hope that comes through his life, that what his ministry means, which he's going to focus in this last part about salvation that's made available in him. Um, but even for us today, like, even though it's a bit different, um, like time, even though no one knows the time that, say, uh, he will return, like only the Father knows this, we still have to be ready. Like it could come within this week, it could come in 100 years, we don't really know that, but, um, but we still have to, that same urgency that, say, just as Jesus was limited time with them, there's a time for them to choose to believe in him. Just now there's that limited time um, that we need to know him. Like, as he calls us in his great commission, like all, what he says in Matthew, like, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nation, nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As say a time will come, just as Jesus is saying with these people in Jerusalem, that he would no longer be with them, there's a time of the offering of grace, the offering of salvation will no longer be made available. 
So for us now, a time will come or say, in his return, that's so. Um, so it's just important for us to acknowledge this, that we don't know this time. So in the times, the opportunities we have to pray, the opportunities we have to um, share with others, um, there still has to be that urgency, even though it could be not in our lifetime. Um, we don't know how much time they have left for grace to transform their lives. Um, But anyway, in the last area of this text we're going to look at is where Jesus is offering salvation to them. He's done, if they believe in him, that they will be saved and that they say the Holy Spirit will also infill them if they are to believe in him. That's where he's kind of leading to where it's like the whole time they have a choice to believe in who he is um, and that the time is limited they have to believe in him, but he's also saying that there's hope in him. Um, which in this last part, it happens at the end of the festival, on the eighth day, which had a bit more of a special significance, um, which briefly, like, what this festival was, in a brief sense, from Leviticus 23 to 26, it, it was saying that it's for seven days, they are to present food offerings to the Lord, and on the eighth day to hold a sacred assembly, present a food offering to the Lord. It is a closing and special assembly, do no regular work. So in, this, so in this sacred assembly, the priests are, say they're going to bring water, I would say, in this golden vessel from the pool of Shalom uh, to the temple for this water pouring ceremony where this water pouring would look towards the new year uh, for abundant rain that would bring about, say, a bountiful harvest. That, and as the water fell onto the altar, from the altar onto the ground, this was kind of symbolic of that. Uh, um, so it's a renewing as it symbolized a putting away of the old for the new, for God would also forgive them of their sins in this. And like with this kind of being a yearly cycle that would happen, it's quite significant the fact that Jesus is then choosing to speak to offer salvation in this new way, that they no longer have to be having to do this in their own, uh, keeping, I guess, in their own strength, rather he'd be doing this in his strength through his work rather than them having to keep this. Um, which... Um, as it reads in this last part of the text for today. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone, uh, sorry, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. As up until that time the spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So we see Jesus is offering a new way that will no longer require say, following these yearly cycles and bringing forth these offerings. Say, what Jesus is going to accomplish on the cross, that will happen as well, that time is to happen, but we know has happened. And um, that will take away our sin and shame and allow us to be holy and walk in relationship once more with God. Where instead of asking the people, say, to have to perform these rituals and offerings, Jesus is saying that if they are to believe in him, that they will be filled with the Holy Spirit and through what he accomplishes on the cross, they will, so this will be renewal and forgiveness of their sins. Um, not by work in which they do, but through the strength, through his strength and his sacrifice. But in this time when he's re saying this, though, they have to wait um, until he is glorified before the infilling of the Spirit would happen for those who believe. Um, as he's kind of saying, though, that's the kind of need for him too. Uh, go as he's saying in chapter 16 verse 7 but very truly I tell you it is a good thing that I'm going away unless I go away the advocate will not come to you but if I go I will send him to you where this advocate is saving the Holy Spirit who is sent by Jesus to the people uh, from the Father who say which is who will draw people to repentance and new life in Christ but as I say the passage continues, we see that there's groups, different groups, some are acknowledging, well, two of the groups mentioned do acknowledge him as the Messiah, one saying he's a prophet, one saying that he is, this is the Messiah, but the others are still, say, getting caught up that he is from Galilee, and, that, and because of that, they're choosing not to believe, um, despite what's happened, and that's also very similar to uh, when the guards go back to the Pharisees, how the Pharisees treat them and respond to them, that the impossibility of him being that in their belief um, 
But for those who did believe, though, forgiveness from their sins is offered and salvation is made available to them. Which is the same that applies for us today. Um, where in, G- in Jesus, a way has been made possible for all who walk to walk in relationship with God once more and to find eternal life through him. Where this is no longer th- has to be something kept by human strength, as the practices in this festival were, but now this would be fulfilled in Jesus' strength and what he has accomplished on the cross in our belief in gr- that grace that is offered freely to us. This is what cleanses our sin and breaks the bondage that sin once held over us. And it is in this belief that we find freedom in Jesus as the Holy Spirit then will enter our hearts, sent, from, sent by Jesus from the Father and do a, a work in us in the, as we walk out also in the world around us. But overall, like this passage we looked at, initially that they had a choice whether or not to accept Jesus and who he was and what he's done. Um, even though they saw the signs, even though they knew who he what he did, what he taught, and how God has been using them. They still had a choice to acknowledge who he was. Um, and as we move forward, we saw, though, that time was limited. Time was, um, he was not going to be with them much longer. And even today, um, say, Jesus, the time that we, we don't know when he's coming back. So there's that urgency that we need to hold, that he could come at any moment. So the time that, of those around us is, is short for them to make that uh, decision as he has in the end offered the hope that, say, he, the sharing of grace, what that means for us, what salvation means for us, and what he's offering differently from what it was in the Old Testament, that the practices they had to hold and what they had to do in their strength um, to be made right with God. But as this is what Jesus has done. So overall, overall God, I just... For this message, um, we work through God. I pray that something's, something holds, something uh, we rest on our hearts on this, God, that we, we get, even though you say all the power and even though you could do all the works before us, God, and even though in our lives many people could come, they could witness to us, they could share with us, or maybe this is for the other way around, we could share it with others. It has to be a choice that we take um, to accept you. It has to be a choice that we choose to believe in you in our hearts. Um, and in that, we find new life. We have that hope that you've offered to us. Because we don't know how, how soon it will come, God, when you say we return in that second coming and when, say, we'll get to be with you in glory, God. But I do pray that this message, if something would hold, if something would rest on our hearts this morning, and if maybe it would encourage us to share or to pray at least for someone we know a little bit more and Um, and I thank you for this morning God and for those here and as we move to communion God as well I pray that you'd use that moment to also reflect on this hope that we have in this what you've done on the cross for our sins God and what that means for us this in your name Amen